What's going on guys? Zeros here. So, Essence of Thought responded, and it's a pretty good response video, I will admit. You know, but um, I'm going to come back, combat some of his points, and uh, clear up some of the arguments that I made. Uh, so, you know, if you guys want to skip this video, I mean, it's not my typical anti-feminist video, so that's fine. But um, before we jump right into this, I'm going to have to say, um, you know, someone commented and said that um, that I was being hypocritical and I was being very condescending and very snarky. And uh, so I watched my video over and I realized, yeah, there were some points where I was being a little condescending, uh, probably really condescending. And I was being very, uh, I was being very snarky. But my snarkiness uh, is an element that I purposely put in these videos. You know, because there's, there's, like I said earlier. Uh, in one of my earlier videos, there's definitely a uh, theatrical element that comes to these videos because they are long. I want them to keep your attention. You know, so when I make the facial expressions, the snarkiness, some of the anger, it, it, it is theatrical. It is to keep uh, your attention. You know, but like I say, like, usually if anything like legitimately makes me upset, like I will say I'm legitimately <laughs> angry about it. You know, but for the most part, it is uh, theatricality. You know, and again, like my snarkiness is definitely. Something a lot of people like, so, uh, yeah. You know, so with that being said, man, uh, I'll definitely apologize if, uh, you know, uh, Peter, if you were offended or if your feelings were hurt, and I don't mean this as, like, sarcastically apologizing to social justice warriors, I mean, like, honestly, if you feel like, you know, I hit you below the belt, I will apologize for that. I will say sorry. I will concede. That being said, you know, uh, let's respond. You know, so, like, in the first, uh, two minutes, he explains basically that the video is um, a year old, right? So that um, basically he was saying that you know if he had another chance, maybe he would change it up or do something differently, right? So um, with that being said, you know his positions could have changed, or he could have had more different reasons, or maybe he changed his mind here or there or something. I think that's what he was explaining in the first two minutes. So uh, I think we, I think it's fine to kind of skip that um, aspect of the video. So, yes, some atheists are definitely militant. And yet, the point of my comment was to acknowledge the fact that when talking about militant with religious individuals, you are talking about violence and homicidal individuals. However, when talking about militant and atheists, you are mainly just talking about people who go out and give their opinion and religious individuals don't like that as such. I fail to see the way in which you disputed this. So, not to be condescending, but I mean, the English language is a pretty hard language to truly encapsulate, you know, both meanings and definitions. And I know we try all the time, but we kind of fail, <laughs> right? So, um, when people, uh, when I say, I guess, Christians or uh, libertarians or anarcho capitalists, when they say, you know, these militant atheists. They're not using the word militant in the concept, in the context of being violent or, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think violent is a, is the best word. They're not using it in the sense that atheists are violent, because clearly they're not. I mean, just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you're violent. You know what I'm saying? But, um, what, what the word means, you know, if you take a look at the definition, it says, uh, it can be extreme, violent or confrontational. So that or means that there are separate definitions within the definition, which means militant does not necessarily always mean violent. It, mean, it can mean confrontational. And there are a lot of atheists who are indeed confrontational. That's, you know, that's the English language. My friend, you know, different words within its definition can then spread out and have different meanings and definitions within the words. You know, you have the denotation and the connotation. You know, so that it's not saying that atheists are violent. I mean, I know atheists are not violent by proxy of being atheists. That's a foolish thing to say. But that's what that's part of the definition of the word militant, confrontational. And if an, if an atheist is being confrontational, then yes, the word a militant atheist does make sense in that context. Well, I have my reasons for standing up and airing my opinion in a peaceful manner. Although very peaceful, and you do it in a very condescending manner. And in fact, it's, it's more so condescending than it is peaceful. I'm certainly verbally aggressive, and I certainly get annoyed when people don't check their facts, because not only are they just stating something, they're recording it, editing it, watching it, and then uploading it, and then they still stand by it and defend it, you know. It's not a case of they just stated something. When I'm in person talking to someone, I'm generally a lot nicer, because I understand people are thinking on their feet. Even I don't do so well when talking to someone in person 
or on my feet, etc. So I do go a bit easier there. Um, however, say I am patronising, I am condescending, that's in no way exclusive with peaceful. So the point of saying that you are indeed condescending was to, uh, was an attempt to get you to kind of look outside yourself for a second. You know, it was an attempt to get you to look and see that maybe there are indeed better ways to portray a message. It doesn't necessarily, so what I'm saying is, you know, uh, in a lot of your video responses to State of Daniel, you kind of treat him like an idiot. Instead of giving him the respect of an intellectual or giving him the respect of an individual who feels differently, you demean him, you condescend him, and I feel like it is indeed ridiculous. You can definitely rebut anything State of Daniel says without the name calling, without the condescension, without you know, uh, trying to make him look stupid. I mean, it's not, it's never really all that difficult to make someone's point look dumb, you know, not if you have a mastery of the English language. So, um, the point of saying that you are indeed condescending is to challenge you to look for better ways to address people. You know, because the whole point of my channel or a lot of the videos I do, even though I am snarky and even though I do have the comedy videos, is to create an environment where we can talk and discuss things. It's to create an environment where the Christians and the atheists can come together, can talk, and can realize we got bigger shit to deal with. There are bigger things happening in the world right now than evolution versus Christianity. The point of doing the videos where I talk about atheists or when I talk about religion being the problem was to show you we got to focus on some bigger stuff. It's, that's what I'm saying. So that's why when I said you're being condescending, it is to challenge you to think of better ways to do it. And of course, I mean, that's up to you to, to change or not change it. I, can't make you change, but that was the point. So it has nothing really to do with you being peaceful. Yes, I can see. But the point of saying that was to challenge your way of thinking. You're not exclusive at all. If you want to join a church, you can. You can join any church you want to join. What? You, what? Well, my point is pretty simple. Churches should not receive tax exemption when, yes, they do exclude certain demographics. Uh, again, no, they don't. Anyone can join any church they want to join. Now, of course, with a few exceptions, I'm sure there are certainly some churches that do exclude people. Uh, I remember I saw one comment say that um, some churches out in the South do, but um, they would definitely be an exception. You know, uh, you know, back to um, an old church that I used to go to. Actually, several churches I went to, uh, they accepted anyone and everyone. You know, uh, atheist, Muslim, doesn't matter who you are. You can come in. You can. Donate if you want, you can attend a service or anything, and you don't necessarily have to convert. You know, a couple of people who do join a church, you start out to be atheists. So, I mean, you know, you can't, you cannot just go into the church always being a Christian. Sometimes you go in there to be converted. Sometimes you go in there to see what they have to say, you know. So, again, it's still not exclusionary by definition because anyone can attend the service or anyone can join the church. An alternative which could cater to everyone would be secular alternatives. Okay, so catering to everyone is different from excluding certain people. Those are two different concepts, you know. When you cater to somebody, that means that your services are provided with the intent for everyone to be used. The police caters to people, okay? Although in the black community, the police kind of selectively decide when they want to show up and when they don't want to show up. However, that's the point of a service that caters to everyone. You know, but when you have like a business or a church, or a charity, or an organization, anyone can donate, anyone can become a part of the, anyone can be a member, anyone can become a part of the service, anyone can, well, there are some jobs you have to have certain requirements, but I mean, for low businesses jobs, you can apply. That's not exclusionary, you know? There's, there's no discrimination there. You can join it, you can enter it, you can purchase things, or you can get separate parts of the service. But it doesn't cater to everyone, okay? Like for, for instance, a business, does it? Well, yeah, businesses do indeed cater to everyone. But, well, actually, they only cater to people who pay for their services. You know, and even in the church, you don't have to pay for the service. You can walk in and sit down and listen to any message that the preacher has on that Sunday. So, again, those are, those are two concepts. Catering to people and excluding people are, are two different things. Because even then, the, the church is not excluding anyone. Okay? By community centers and the likes. Because then... They do, in fact, cater to everyone, compared to churches or different religious groups that will not cater to the non-believer. So, uh, let's put this into a little bit more context then, okay? So, 
what the church members do is ultimately the, the job of the church or what it's supposed to be is to give out information right to give out information about the bible and to teach people different passages and interpretations so if someone is proselytizing on the streets and giving out pamphlets they're doing they're catering to everyone they're giving everyone information that's the ultimate point of a church it's just to spread information about the bible really so i mean even then even they, they're still they can cater to everyone i mean it's not really like a business but it's still not exclusionary so even at the end of the day nobody is being excluded for for the most part again i will concede you can definitely show me a list of churches that certainly do exclude some people but they're not the made up they're not majority of churches or at least it's not supposed to be very basic understanding there goes that condescension i was talking about and also if you still want to keep your churches then surely donations from their followers can cover the taxes. Well, okay, but I mean, again, the, the whole point was the reason why you fight against religion, but even if you make the argument that churches are exempt from tax evasion, I think that's more of a reason why churches pay taxes, not why they should go away. I mean, there are lots of charities that don't pay taxes. So by that logic, you are saying that since any organization that doesn't pay any type of taxes or faces tax exemption should go away and that also includes different military organizations and different charities so i mean when it comes to the overall theme of my video which is you're not really battling against religion you're really battling against other problems it still kind of fits into that and why is it that they receive such a privilege the answer is pretty obvious, it's because churches solely survive based on the donations given to them by their members. Members who could be anyone, any race, any sex, anything. Anyone can be a member of any church they so choose. And again, churches survive off the donations given to them by their members. Because they're all donations. You cannot tax somebody's donation. No, that's a false statement. Churches often have businesses out of the back of their churches, or even purchase property to rent out or to sell on, etc. Okay, so later in the video, I, um describe that some churches do survive solely based off of donations. Some churches do. Then you have other churches, which I had mentioned later in the video, like EX Ministries sells DVDs. Some churches, he's right, do have um, backdoor businesses, like they'll sell different types of pastries and stuff like that, and they do rent property. Yeah, all that's true. However, it, it doesn't change the fact that some churches do survive solely based off of donations and donations themselves cannot be taxed by the US government because you're giving them money so uh, okay so I mean I guess he may have added some more information about different churches but I mean that's not all churches you know that's not every single church I mean the, the church is a huge umbrella where you have different organizations within that umbrella so I mean if you point and click out different organizations like the Catholic Church I mean yeah you'll be right in this situation but not right in the other situation. Uh, I mean, let's just do some basic maths, right? Churches, or should I say religious organizations, receive 71 billion US dollars in tax exemption each year. There are 313 million US citizens. Now, are you claiming that each one of those US citizens annually donates over $200? This is including children. Donates over $200 annually. And that's only taking into consideration the tax exemption. That's not taking into consideration the entire profit margin of the theocratic financial empire, if you will. Your statement there about it just being donations doesn't add up. Okay, so uh, I understand what you're saying now. So um, from this point forward, any point where you repeat the fireproof insurance thing, I'll probably skip over or cut out because you would just be reiterating your point. But I understand what you're saying now. So uh, that makes sense. But then again, which is the overall theme of my video was if these are your problems with religion then you're not fighting the ideology of religion itself you're fighting you're fighting with economics right because religious organizations are not the or only organizations that are exempted from taxes okay and also religious organizations are not the only organizations that taxes pay for taxes pay for the military <laughs> right to go fund a bunch of wars that I honestly don't want anyone to take part in, you know? So what you would be upset about is the fact that the government is taking taxes to go pay for a free service. But then again, free lunch for students who, or welfare for parents who don't have jobs, 
is the same thing. You know, you're they're taking taxes out of um, the collection and then they're giving it to a bunch of other people. So now, if you disagree with that, that's your prerogative. If you dislike free lunch and free welfare, if you dislike the free fireproof service, I understand that. That's lots of people do. But this is economics. And that was wholly the point of that first section. You're arguing economics. You're not arguing theology. You're not saying the world would be better without religion. You, uh, I mean, a solution to the whole, you know, churches, uh, churches should just get taxed. That's that's the solution. That's what you want. That's what you would be fighting for. But you're not. You're fighting for its eradication. And if that's why you're fighting for its eradication, you'd have to fight for the eradication of different organizations and nonprofit charities that also receive the same privileges and the same tax exemptions. So, okay, so you're right. You're right. Churches do get the free service and people do pay for that. But that's not, it's not the only organization ever. So that would mean by that logic, you'd have to apply that to other situations. Otherwise, you're just being biased. And that's an unfair way to look at anything. Is then given to the church for free. Thus, that money is coming directly out of everybody's pocket. Do you see that transaction there? The government takes money from one group of people, uses it for a service that it then gives to another organization for free. Very basic understanding there. Okay, there you go. Again, one, you're being condescending, and two, you are proving the point that I made earlier. Right now, we're not arguing theology, we're arguing economics. So if we get back to the point of my video, you're not, it doesn't change anything that I've ultimately said. So where I was factually wrong, I will concede you have proven me wrong in several cases. That's fine. But you have yet to provide a logical reason as to why the organization should be removed altogether. Because what you're just saying is that the churches need to be taxed and that's the solution. It, they don't need to be eradicated. In fact, if the churches were then being taxed, guess what? We could then take that money, the, well, the U.S. government can take that money, and then use it for whatever they want to use it for, which will not necessarily be for the benefit of people. You have to acknowledge that, too. The U.S. government does take those taxes. It doesn't necessarily mean anything is going to be fixed with that money. They could just use it to go fund a military like they've been doing for the last several decades. So, again, you're not providing any reason as to why the churches should be eradicated. We're arguing economics. Tax the churches. If that church should survive, then surely God will will the people to donate a little bit more to cover that tax difference. I mean, I guess. I, okay, again, we're still arguing economics, so uh, I'm not sure why you threw that in there. Of 30 billion US dollars over a decade could eradicate world hunger, regardless of religious affiliation. How? Seriously, how? Are, are the children going to eat the green dollars? How is money going to solve world hunger? No, to be completely literal, food is going to solve world hunger, or more specifically, the production of food. Not even I'm that condescending. Yes, I know about agriculture. Yes, I know about infrastructure. I was merely giving people a quantifiable amount, which was given by the UN. Well done. Oh, oh. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Master, I, I know you're not here to, you know, pat me on the head, you know, but but thank you for being so condescending again. I, I you know, I, yeah, all that sarcasm aside, man. I guess I was kind of hoping we could not get into the whole condescension thing, but I guess not. But um, to actually respond to your point, uh, again, we're arguing economics. Even still. You, what you've done is you've made the assumption that should you get rid of the church or the organization or the religion, that they're going to take the money or the proceeds of taxes and then put it towards, I guess, ending world hunger or put it towards something positive. Well, not necessarily. That's not true. In fact, they could just take all that money and just fund it into the military like the U.S. government does for most things, or they can take that money and use it to fund different types of welfare, not necessarily ending world hunger. Hunger, not necessarily doing anything positive. It could be absolutely negative. They could take that money and use it to build up um, prisons. And you know, you might say that that is a uh, slippery slope argument fallacy, but no, it's not a slippery slope. It's definitely possible. That could definitely happen if they take the money and use it to build up other organizations. Well, that's not a slippery slope. That could happen. So. Oh, could it possibly be that the UN likely calculated pre-existing charity organizations into figuring out 
how much more money it would require to stop world hunger. Yeah, it could have been. Like, yeah, it's possible they did that, but even still, that's that's not a rebuttal. That's you're just saying what they could have done. You haven't shown me that's actually what they did. And assuming, let's just assume that is exactly what they did. Well, again, the you're still not addressing the main point. And the main point being, should you get rid of religion, you're not going to automatically fix that problem because religion doesn't cause that problem to be fixed. Could that possibly be why? Also, could it possibly be the fact that no, these organizations do not have that 30 billion dollars? To answer your question, yeah, it's possible. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily the case. I mean, giving me a suggestion of what could be reality is not the same as correctly telling me or describing what reality is. I, so, to answer your question, yeah, it could be possible. But, I mean, it doesn't change my earlier point or the overall theme of the video. Not million, but 30 billion dollars. So, at that point, I misspoke. I mis misspoke. See, I'm doing it now. So, I was wrong. You know, um, there are a couple of things I have been wrong with um, in this video. And I'm going to say it right now. Time market, where I say there were some things I was wrong with. I'm human. I was wrong. But, even though I'm being wrong on some of the cases thus far, we still have not hit the overall theme. The overall question being, if you got rid of this, how are you making the world better? How is this an, an ultimate problem in the world? Because there are other organizations and other services that taxes provide and pay for that are given free to a bunch of people in America right now. Again, you got welfare. Uh, you got the military is funded by a bunch of taxes, and then you have all the free lunches for kids in, in school. So we have to keep the whole thing in its context, and we're just getting mad because then there's other charities and other organizations that don't have to pay taxes too. Other secular organizations that get the same tax exemptions. So you can't be biased and say, well, the church does it, and I don't like religion, so they have to go, and then everything else is, you know, no, that's, that's not objective. That's not true. You're going to have to make up your mind across the board. The charities, the secular charities, the military, no more food stamps, no more of that, since that's paid by on taxes, no more churches. Or everybody has to pay taxes. It can't be one or the other just based on your arbitrary whim. Annually secured over a steady period of time. Your argument is pretty much, these people are not fixing the issue instantly. Therefore, no, we shouldn't give them any more resources that they actually require to do so. Be designed to end world hunger. Your case isn't looking too good right now, Essence of Thought. Why? Because in the overall message of the video, you have still not demonstrated how getting rid of religion is going to fix any of the problems in the world. That is why your argument, your case, is, your case still doesn't look good, because we've been arguing economics this whole time. The money would just be rerouted to secular charities. How would you know that? The only way you would be able to do that is if you were a representative in the U.S. government and you wrote a bill in order to get that to happen. Otherwise, the U.S. government can just take that money and do what, whatever they will. Okay, so again, I keep saying this over and over again, you haven't shown me that getting rid of religion is going to fix any of the world's problems. This video is titled, Why You Fight Against Religion. We've been talking about economics, not theology. However, it averages out about the same. So it wouldn't decrease the money going in. It would just mean that it would be rerouted somewhere where it could be used more effectively. If the US government was, that would be strictly against the First Amendment of the US Constitution then we agree by the Constitution that these churches and these organizations must be taxed because they are reliant upon services which, yes, the non-religious individuals are also footing the bill for. So, really, you're only half right. Because what the taxes are indeed paying for is the fireproof protection and other services that the government provides to the church. 
However, if we want to be literal and very specific, they're not technically paying for the church itself. They're paying for benefits that the church gets for being a church. But that's not paying for the building. That's not paying for the service. That's not paying for the books. That's not paying for the DVD production. That's not paying for any of that. It's paying for the services. So, again, I can see. Indirectly, they're paying for services the church gets, but they're not technically paying for the church building itself. Right. So what you would want is the churches to be taxed. OK. And by proxy, every other tax exempt organization must also be taxed, too. Throughout history, religion has proven itself time and time again to be the reason or even the excuse behind the most heinous of occurrences. You want to know what else has been used as an excuse? The theory of evolution. Rage, anger, frustration, the fact that some races are not as superior as others. Those are also excuses used to do very horrible things to people. Uh, in 1871, I think, uh, the U.S. government scrapped old treaties with Native Americans because they thought that they were a race of stupid natives and didn't know what was going on. And then they forced them to go traverse the Trail of Tears on reservations. Nothing to do with religion, and yet an entire group of people lost their homes because someone thought that they were inferior. N nothing to do with religion, just because, you know, just because the U.S. government wanted the land. And you've linked that to evolutionary theory how? I haven't. Those were two separate examples. The first section of that clip was me explaining different reasons or different excuses people use to murder or justify killing someone. That's its own bubble. The next thing was an example of an atrocity, something horrible happening to a group of people that had nothing to do with religion. They are two separate things in the same clip. However, they're not, they're not necessarily related to one another. I'm not saying they did that because of theory of evolution, because as it turns out, I was wrong. It was actually the Native American Registration, not, not Registration, but um, Removal Act was ratified in 1830, and the Trail of Tears occurred in 1838. So I was wrong. So by saying that, the theory of evolution, I don't even think it was published by then. But the point that I was making was that an atrocity, something horrible that happened to a group of people occurred not because of religion, but because of selfish men trying to gain power. So... Evolution is a field of science. Thank you for explaining that to me. I, I didn't know. I'm just... Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, dumb, I'm a dumbass. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I'm... I'm ignorant. But thank you for explaining that to me. I... I had no idea. I really didn't. I... I'm just dumb. It is a moral. Darwin himself, however, did not agree with the idea of superior races. Cultures is a different matter, but superior races he was against to the point that he was an abolitionist before the American Civil War had taken place in the US. That's fantastic. But it actually kind of serves a pretty good argument I'm about to make right here. So you're saying that Darwin didn't believe that some races were and more superior than others. Okay, that's fine. Darwin wasn't racist, I guess. I can conduct some more research to see if that's true or not, but I'm going to take your word for it. That being the case, I can then say that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or allegedly the Son of God, uh, gave a whole bunch of wisdom to people, right? And there's several different books that his apostles wrote. And he said, love others as you love yourself. And people can take that out of context and use it to do horrible things. If anything, all you have done is strengthen the point that I've made. Because the theory of evolution itself is a theory to explain why things are the way they are. Right? And yet, people have still used it as a reason or an excuse as to why they can wipe out an entire race of people. It was still being used to do something bad. That doesn't mean the theory itself is bad. It means what the people did with the misinformation or the misunderstanding are horrible. Which goes back to my original theme. It doesn't matter if you get rid of religion. Because the ultimate problem are men vying for power. And talking of the American Civil War, it is the Bible that teaches that certain groups of people and certain demographics are the superior and that you may keep men from different nations indefinitely. Yeah, exactly. And it was the same Bible that was used to prevent a case against that. First, let's talk about context. Uh, I think those... Uh, actually, you're going to have to show me where in the Bible uh, that is. Because, again, I'm stupid. <laughs> but 
Even then, it was the same Bible that was used to defend by the abolitionists that the blacks should be able to go free. And the argument was, well, since God gave us free will, then all races, everybody, should be able to be free to make their own decisions. The same Bible used to convey two different points, right? So, okay, I, I, yeah, you're right, but I mean, the counter-argument came from the same Bible. And even if the people interpreted it that way, it still doesn't mean that they weren't wrong. Now, you're going to probably ask, how do I know they weren't wrong? And I will be honest, I don't know. It just doesn't necessarily mean they were correct, just because I don't know if they were wrong or right. This was used as justification for slavery during the Civil War. Boom. Mic drop. Drops mic. So, there's going to be a sequel. Um... To Essence of Thoughts video. He said that I was special. He said that I'm a special guy. I feel so good about myself. But, uh, no, Peter, uh, again, all theatrics aside, me being serious, uh, Zarius to Peter, not Zeus the character, because Zeus is a character I play, but Zarius to Peter, if you want, you know, we could have a Google Hangout and we can discuss this because your next response, I don't know how long it will be. I don't know if I should make the whole thing. So I think a Google Hangout would be good so we can talk this out. You know, and that way all the condescension, all the condescending and all the theatrics, we're going to throw that out of the door. We're going to come in like adults and we're going to talk it out. We can do that, but that's up to you. If you want to do it, it's your choice. And to anyone else who, you know, stuck by and watched this video, man, I want to say, you know, thanks. You didn't have to check this out. This is from me to Peter, but, you know, if you hung by, thanks. But, um, Yeah. It's that time. So, guys, if you like this video, please go ahead and click that like button. Go ahead and click that subscribe button. Comment in the comment box below. And as always, have a great day. I'll see you cool cats soon. Adios.